My name is Natalie Gochner, and I direct the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute. Uh, this is the Thomas S. Monson Center, an embassy for the University of Utah downtown, and once a month we have a newsmaker breakfast. This is our April newsmaker breakfast. We are focused on funding of Salt Lake City's critical needs, uh, a very complex topic and something I'm interested to learn more about. Uh, before we, I introduce our guests, I just want to thank uh, the Gardner Policy Institute staff for all their work in putting this on. Let's give them a hand. So today's topic is Salt Lake City's Funding Our Future initiative. Uh, our capital city is growing, it's changing. We expect that growth to continue. It brings lots of opportunities for our city. It also brings challenges. Uh, those challenges can be broken down into a lot of things, but for today we're going to be talking about street maintenance, affordable housing, transit service, and public safety. Uh, through years of study, planning, and public involvement, the administration and council staff have identified hundreds of millions of dollars of, I'm, I'm going to call them unfunded needs. And you can imagine that this isn't something that happens overnight, this is something that builds over time. And so today, we ha are very uh, happy to have two of the most important leaders in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'll introduce Mayor Biskupski first. Uh, mayor Biskupski was uh, uh, elected mayor in 2015. I got to know her when she served in the Utah legislature from 1999 to 2011. That's a labor of love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she also served as administrator in the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office. She has a long and distinguished career in uh, public service. Let's give Mayor Biskupski a hand. Thanks for being here, Jackie. Aaron Mendenhall is chair of the Salt Lake City Council, was first elected in 2013, re-elected in 2017. Congratulations. Uh, brings a lot of experience in advocacy, education policy, and has worked on legislation focused on air quality and quality growth, as well as many other things. Uh, we like to say that she's a proud University of Utah alum, so give uh, Aaron Mendenhall a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Can you not claim that, Jackie? You don't have any University of Utah ties? I am a sun devil, oh, but, boy. but... My daughter was a sun devil. You can always find a sun devil. My whole family is a big supporter of the University of Utah sports, and so... <laughs> That's great. Well, I wanted to start uh, just sort of a little tradition here by just getting to know the two of you a little bit better. So before we go to the hard public policy stuff, let's just... Um, well, are you guys both native Salt Lakers? I don't even know. No, I grew up in Minnesota. Okay. And um, it's very cold there, as you know. And so I trekked to Arizona to go finish my college career. And then that was very hot, as you know. So I came up here on a ski trip, and then I never left. So It's a familiar story. Erin, yeah. how about in your case? I actually started in Arizona. I was born in the Tempe area. Right. Sun uh, Devil area. Yeah, that's right. My father was part of the Tempe Diablos, the booster club down there that opened Tempe Diablos Stadium. And then... We moved here to the Salt Lake Valley when I was only seven years old. I've, uh, I transplanted myself the week I graduated high school at Alta High School down to the ninth and ninth neighborhood, and I've basically never left. I just move in a very small radius uh, a few times in the last 20 years. Very nice. Uh, this is a little bit of an off-the-wall question, but what kind of cars do both of you drive? Uh, they say you can tell a lot well, about a person you know, by what they drive. Well, you know, all lesbians have Subarus, so there. <laughs> there you go. And you do have a Subaru. I do. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <laughs> I drive a Nissan Leaf. Okay. And just for fair, I'm a Volvo person. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the last one on kind of getting to know you, I just think this is so interesting that um, our capital city has two uh, women serving in the top, um, you know, leadership roles. And I'm just wondering what it is that motivated both of you to get into public service. Um, for a lot of people in the audience that I know so well, we love public policy and we would never dream of putting our name on a ballot. And some of it's because we've worked with elected officials and we know what that's like. Sure. <laughs> and some of us, uh, you know, just, uh, I don't know, don't have the confidence maybe? I don't know, but Aaron, what I think got that's you a into? narrative that we unfortunately grow up with. And even paying attention and having an opinion about politics, that's a narrative that's given to women that I, uh, had, it's taken a long time for me to foist that off of my shoulders, but it was really a uh, deep caring for other people. I love to meet strangers. I found out that I'm, I enjoy campaigning and knocking on doors, but truly it was that Jill Remington Love was the 
only woman on the council at the time she was not going to run again. She'd been the only woman on the council the majority of her 12 years. And the thought of an all-male council really turned the fire up in me. And that's, uh, that was the, the issue that pushed me into the race, ultimately. Yeah. Well, great. We're glad you're serving. Uh, Mayor, how about for you? Well, I forever have been doing public service, as you said, and it's always been inequities, unjust um, policies, it's been human suffering, you know, that drives me. And one of the opportunities that I saw as the role of a mayor was bringing more equity so that people have the same opportunities to be successful. And that's part of what we will talk about today was the importance of having transit so that people can get to and from their jobs. Not everyone can afford a car. And we take that for granted and, and we rely on bus service, but many people in this city do. And yet the bus service isn't meeting their needs for employment. And so there's this gap that is creating unnecessary suffering in families in our city. So it's things like that that really drove me to come in. And then economic development. If you're not very focused on economic development, you miss opportunities. And as the capital city, I believe it is our role to be the economic engine for the state. But we also have an obligation to those who live here to create from entry to executive level positions. And that has been a driving force behind my economic development department and a charge that they have been given. And they are more than su ex succeeding in that endeavor. Um, a lot of what we do in public finance is talk about equity versus efficiency, which is economic development versus fairness. So you and I should talk some more. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I want to stay with you for just a minute longer, Mayor, and then we'll have Aaron comment on this, but I think it's really helpful to give this audience a sense of the state of the city right now, because we're going to go talk about these unfunded needs and how do we pay for them, but what's the state of the city? And in, I'm a big soccer player, and so we like to say, what's the field of play? You know, is it, are, we, are we at a high elevation? Is the field wet or dry? What's the temperature like? Is the sun out? What, what, what is the state of the city right now? You know, things are good, um, but we have some work to do. And that was part of what drove, I think, both of us into the work that we are doing today. Um, you know, we have a strong economy. And with a strong econ economy comes growth. But growth doesn't pay for growth. And when you're the capital city, you get some funding for growth through many avenues, but the reality of the capital city is we have a community here where people are coming in. They're coming in for medical service, they're coming in for an education, they're coming in for entertainment, they're coming here for conventions, they're coming here as visitors. All of that is being supported on the backs of residents, and, and we have to be able to share those services and, and what comes with those services, that expense, right? So that's part of what we're trying to do is share the expense of providing all of those services uh, with those who are, you know, acquiring them. Aaron, give us some color commentary on the field of play in the city. Color commentary. Don't <laughs> encourage me too much, Natalie. Uh, I would agree with the mayor and that we're at a unique point for growth in our city. We are along the Wasatch Front and that uh, Wasatch 2040 and the other vision planning, uh, modeling and research that's been happening for decades now has been telling us this growth is coming, we're in the midst of it, and yet we're at a unique place, I believe, in our economic development growth. Uh, just last night, the city council was presented the airport's budget, you know, that we're essentially building a brand new airport. It's not just a terminal redevelopment plan. $3.5 billion new airport that'll be opening in 2020. Um, the, we can't avoid the conversation too long about the possibilities and the future of an inland port developing in Salt Lake City, which is being called one of the biggest economic development opportunities for the state as a whole. 
Um, and that those challenges, not to mention our residential growth, and where do we grow as a re truly built out city? Where do we grow with density? And how do we focus even things like our accessory dwelling units, that mother-in-law conversation that's been floating around City Hall for about a year now. It's back, it came back last night. If you care about where we have mother-in-laws, please participate in the conversation. We rely on great information like you have from James Wood to help us make these decisions. But it's a unique growth time for the city and the mayor and I I think share uh, deep care for equity as that growth happens uh, I came into politics from an air quality non nonprofit background I still care deeply about the environmental concerns and I feel that Salt Lake City has been and it still is a leader a forerunner on environmental progressive policy for the state of Utah and we should be I came back from working in Washington, D.C. in 2006, and I can say as recently as 2006, it was just a dream to have a downtown grocery store. It was just a dream to have dynamic urban living downtown. That's how, freak, that's how you know, um, frequent or well, is it, how new that is to us. Okay, well, so we've got these needs, these unfunded needs. I'd want to hear about the process. I want to hear you describe to this group in affordable housing and transit, streets, public safety, what process did you go through to uh, enumerate these needs? Sure. So um, part of what I did when I first came in was charge our different departments to create plans. You know, we, we had to identify the needs. Uh, we had to create plans around those needs. And now we have those plans. So for the first time ever, Salt Lake City has a transit master plan. We have an affordable housing plan. We have our clean energy plan to help clear our air. You know, and with all of that planning, now we have this unique opportunity to, to implement. And implementation, as we have realized in, through our streets assessment, you know, our streets assessment isn't somebody going out and looking at a road and deciding for themselves what that condition is. We had technology running through every street in this community assessing the, the condition of the roads. So we know two-thirds of our roads are in poor or worse condition. Two-thirds. I mean, it's a high number. And, and to make up for that, you know, we had to figure out a plan. How are we going to get ahead of this? And we developed a 10-year plan. Uh, but that plan is expensive. You, in order for us to kind of get to a place of good or better condition for our roads, you know, we have a 10-year plan that is probably about 20, 25 million a year to get us caught up, just to get to that space where we can maintain it in an efficient and effective way and not keep falling behind. Go ahead, Erin. I'd love to jump in that uh, to compliment the administration on the planning process that's happened and the public input process that went into the transit master plan um, and thanks, the affordable housing plan, our growing SLC, that five-year plan to get at the 7,500 units that we need, we know we need in Salt Lake City. Uh, this, these, all of these plans, except for the pavement condition survey, which was quite technical and not a public process. This is where the technology was out on the streets, yes. okay. Yeah, and as I said last night, I don't want to pick the streets that need to be redone in my district because uh, I think anyone's eye is not as accurate as the technology that was used to make those determinations. But there's been years of public process going into these master plans, and then the council's review of the results from the administration and ultimate approval of the transit master plan and growing SLC. So I see a little bit of a catch-22 here, and, and the catch-22 I'm going to describe is just that um, some, uh, I'll, I'm going to say hypothetically, okay, but some city leaders can just kick these cans down the road. And, and they pile up, but they kick them down the road. And we have no better example of that than Washington, D.C., where that seems to be the way they do business. And, and if you kick cans down the road, you don't have any of this uh, public, um, you know, I'll say controversy of how do you raise taxes to help with this. But if you do something, then you, you catch people's eye because you're going to raise their taxes. So I want to just hear a little bit about how you've 
uh, I've dealt with the issue of we've got to face this, but at the same time, it's a difficult thing to do. And I don't mean politically difficult. I mean it, it's actually hard on the economy, right? Because you you take some money from people that go to this that they could use for other things. And I just I'd love to hear you start to talk about how did you get the courage to um, you know be so forward looking about taking care of these right. needs? Well, you know, I, I think I'm I'm practical, and as a mother, for instance, and running a household, um, you have to take care of your home. If you don't invest in your home and take care of your home, you, it loses value. And the city is the same. If we aren't taking care of the city and investing in our city, we end up losing value. And at some point, it ends up costing us more than it should have to keep it in good condition to begin with. So pay more now or pay a lot more later. Yeah, yeah pay yeah. more now or pay a lot more later. And in essence, we are what we're looking at is a pile of cans that has oh, yeah. uh, inadvertently been kicked down the road. And I say inadvertently because a, p a large piece of this is a result of the 2008 recession and the uh, reduction in revenue that the city was faced with. There right. are literally streets on life support that need life support, and there are streets that are dead, and that's so about you got, 20%. What did you say, Mayor? 60-something percent of the streets are not what yeah. you... 64. 64. 64 percent. And then uh, make the case on unaffordable housing. Tell us the issue there. I so, think it's... Speak, a lot of us yes. know this, but I want to hear you. You describe. know, we came in, we knew that we had a very large deficit of nearly 9,000 housing units. Um, and... And we have made a dent in those affordable units. We did about six million in investment over the last two years. It brought 155 million of investment into the city to bring affordable housing to bear. But we still have 75,000 units, 7,500 7, units in the city that we need. And so there's still work to be done. And we're talking about you know, homes for your barista. We're talking about homes for that first year school teacher. We're talking about homes for your preschool teachers. Your, and these are individuals who are not making a lot of money, but that we rely on for service. And so we want to get people out of their cars. We want them to be able to live in the city where they work, but we have to create that affordable housing in order for them to be able to do it. Erin, affordable housing. Every one of us is affordable housing, I believe, at some point in our lives. My mother is right now. My little brother is occasionally. I have been, and I probably will be again at some point in my life. I think that when people realize within their own first degree of separation, their own families and immediate friends, the real need for access to affordable housing at different stages in our lives, um, and the, if, if anyone knows, what they're, if you're renting right now or if you know people who are renting, we know that almost half of the renters in our city are in unaffordable housing. They're paying more than 30% of their income towards their rent, which sets us up for losing our housing with an accident, a medical condition, you know, you name it. Some unique circumstance puts uh, our housing in jeopardy, and that is too big of a risk. Erin, let's stay with you for a second. T tell us about the 50 police officers. So in the public safety category, you've got 50 police officers that you brought on. Tell us the funding challenge there. Right. We had a proposal from the administration to add 27 officers, and the council is keenly aware of the need for consistent police presence, really community-oriented policing throughout the city, and ask questions about the ratio of officers, that be best practice ratio of officers to how many citizens we need to have that uh, adequate police presence. And we know that at night, when it's us as residents in the city, we're doing well on that number. But as our workday population essentially doubles Monday through Friday, we are below that best practice level and sometimes to a significant amount. Um, and it's during those times of the day when we end up having to take officers from one area and suck them into another area and move them to another area. We have a police chief who I think is here today, Mike Brown, who recognizes and wants community-oriented policing in our city, which means 23 beats. That's dividing our city up into 23 quadrants and having essentially 24-hour police, regular police, so these are 
imagine three officers that you know their faces because they're always in your neighborhood, whether you're coming home at 11 o'clock at night or you're leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning. You know their face. They're doing that community-oriented policing. Getting to 50 gets us to the ability of staffing with what we ex have existing in the police department and what we're about to add to be able to do those 23 beats and do community-oriented policing. Yeah, very good. It's fun to see how much you all know about this topic. I'm, it gives me confidence. Uh, Mayor Biskupski, the why don't we have enough money for these police officers? Well, um, you, I, I'm bringing it to you because right. you said growth doesn't pay, always pay for doesn't itself. Doesn't pay for itself, and so one of the challenges that I faced when I came in was um, moving one-time money from being the source for ongoing needs, and we've done a very good job of cleaning up that book and being more fiscally sound in our processes and making sure that when we have an ongoing need that we are using ongoing funding. So part of our dilemma is moving from 27 officers to 50. We had some one-time money to uh, meet that need, but our ongoing need is real. And so we want to make sure that we are funding these officers with ongoing money, and that's where the sales tax opportunity comes in. Plus the growth, as uh, Council Chair was saying uh, about growth, with our growth and with our influx of population during the day, we are going to need more officers as this continues, and that will require some ongoing funding as well, plus the support staff the prosecutors, the 911 dispatchers, that all come with that. Yeah. Aaron, I, I wanted ahead. to chime in on that last point because in my five years on the council, I think that we're taking a very clear look at the actual needs associated with the feel-good part for us of the funding. The council was enthusiastic to fully staff the 23 beat officers, but the reality is we need 13 civilian positions in order to support that type of an increase of staff. And the mayor mentioned that it's it's easier for us to say we're just going to take a bite at the the part we want to report on and not necessarily fund the need completely. And we are doing that in this case. Okay, so you mentioned sales tax, uh, Jackie. Uh, uh, we need to. This is a this is a hard newsmaker breakfast because it's so complicated. But help us understand the history of this sales tax because it somehow ties in with the relocation of the state prison. Am I correct? In other words, you were given yeah, this authority. So Originally, um, during a previous administration, uh, um, and I wasn't there, so I only know so much, um, but the state gave the city a sales tax increase in exchange for a prison. Essentially, it's kind of... You, they gave you the ability the to ability do ability to do a sales tax increase independent of any other city or the state. Um, and it's existed, so it's been there for several years. And there was talk of, you know, we, we need the uh, ability to utilize this tax, but I did not want to rush into any utilization without understanding our needs and having significant plans so that as we implement, we can track. And that was a big piece for me. I wanted to make sure that if we were going to go down the road and use this tax, that we could report to you how that funding was being spent. And so we have a, a, a link now, a website link for you as you go on and you do a survey about this tax that will be turned into a dashboard that will allow us the opportunity to show you how this sales tax increase is being spent year after year and the projects that that is going to or the human capital that it is being spent on for public safety. So what the proposal you have on the table, as I understand it, <clears throat> excuse me, is a 0.5% increase in the sales tax. That's five cents on a $10 purchase. Excludes raw food groceries. Excludes groceries. Uh, how, how's it being received? I... I don't want to be too optimistic because it's really not my nature to, to be optimistic. But we have had uh, quite a lot of public process. We've uh, convened workshops around the city. 
Um, every community council has been visited or is, is about to finish being visited. We've been holding public hearings. We'll have another public hearing on Tuesday. We have the online survey over 1,000 respondents, um, 1,500. I know that number is growing. Um, and then all the social media outreach. And from the residents, it is actually quite consistent with what I've been hearing over the last four and a half years of my time on the council, which is we so desperately want to affect air quality. We so much want to be able to ride in a bus when it's more convenient and more affordable than getting in our car, which it isn't yet. And our roads are in deplorable condition and we want neighborhood safety. That that theme I've heard knocking on doors two times in my district, being through campaigns and being through years of public hearings, has remained consistent. Residents and it's are worth the five cents on a ten dollar purchase. Residents have been incredibly supportive, yeah. but we're we're still in those conversations. We're still hearing from the business community as well. So we have Bill Knowles on our book. Um, he is a, an, a public engagement expert, and he's been doing the the business piece for us. And he's held at least six of his own engagements with business groups or, uh, um, or organizations, and also is receiving tremendous support for this, um, especially from the small business owners, which, you know, if anyone is hardest hit, it is them, and, and yet they find value in this, and they find value in the opportunity of uh, increasing our transit services uh, along those corridors where their shops are located. Erin, you look ready to go. Let's do it. I wanted to add one more thing. I think part of the, um, the warmth that we've received on this is that it's a sales tax and not a property tax. And as we've mentioned, uh, I think we may have already said the number 43% of our city is taxable. Um, that means a lot of it is not. That's right. <laughs> and it's so in when we hands of uh, charitable organizations, religious schools, organizations, government. Government, all of that. And so when we talk about where's the money coming from for these really core functions, it's particularly of public safety and streets, that to more equitably distribute that as I see it, we're showing that the majority of the sales tax collected would be from non-city residents, from those coming into the city. How do you, and I, I, we're not going to take a lot of time on this, but uh, car purchases loom large here, right? Because you have a lot of city uh, auto dealerships. I live in Murray. We have the Larry Miller Mile. We have a whole mile of car dealerships. It's very fortunate for our city. Um, but, uh, I, you know, is it true that this tax increase will put you at a disadvantage to the Larry H. Miller mile for car purchases? No, because it doesn't impact large purchases like That's that. That's what I thought you might say. Yeah, it, it excludes it. Okay, and, so and that was not our design. That is how it is designed. That's how the state gave it to yeah. you. Yeah, okay. That's right. I, I had not heard, like, the car dealerships speaking out in any big way. That explains yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, let me do another one for you, and, and then we'll move on. But uh, because I live in Murray, I am also uh, live by Fashion Place Mall. Yes. Fashion Place Mall is the largest grossing mall in our state, mm -hmm. and it is just bursting at the seams. Right. If you don't know that. Right. Uh, you know, would a tax increase like this put uh, City Creek Center and Gateway at a disadvantage to the suburbia malls? I'm happy to... Go uh, first, if I, you don't. Yeah, if you don't mind. I met with <laughs> Linda Wardell just yesterday morning to have this conversation. She's the general manager of City Creek Center. She is. And, of course, she expressed concern about any increase in sales tax um, and the recognition of the competing malls. And we also must recognize, as, as Linda does, the difference of an urban mall experience, the downtown experience that people come in to City Creek um, and co connect that with a trip to the university or to a jazz game uh, or to the theater at the Eccles, and that it is a destination trip to make. Very different. And so the shopping itself is very different. They're cultivating a very different caliber of shopping experience, um, and they're proud of that. But I, to compare that to other urban areas, uh, this sales tax will put us at 7.35%. Uh, Denver is about a percentage above that. Uh, Phoenix is a percentage above Denver, and Seattle is a percentage above Phoenix. So 
of those four uh, Western capitals. So even for like convention Seattle's business, not a capital, but <laughs> yeah, right. but even for like convention business, it won't be seen as right a detriment. And thank you for bringing no. that up because when we talk about attracting conventions, the conventions aren't deciding between here and Murray. No offense to Murray, they're deciding between Salt Lake City <laughs> and enough. Denver. And they'll we, only come to Murray if they need a tr right. level one trauma. We're center. A, a full percentage <laughs> with this tax increase. We would be a full percentage below Denver. Yeah, and what I will also say is the growth in Murray. I mean, if you look at what happened with their uh, mall, um, their taxes are currently higher than ours. Yeah. And so even with a higher tax there, that mall is um, drawing the businesses that it is wanting. And we have done a very successful job of drawing a very unique business clientele in City Creek. We have a company that has picked up Gateway and um, is finding some anchor tenants to take on that property and, and bring it into the fold as an entertainment type uh, neighborhood, not so much a shopping mall like it was. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Uh, you have provided incredible context, so thank you. Very helpful. I'm going to turn to you in just a minute. I'm going to have one last question for him. So be thinking of your questions. The, the last thing I wanted to ask the two of you, uh, because you're the capital city, um, your relationship with the state of Utah looms large. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you the question, how does the state figure into all of this? How does the legislature, Governor Herbert, uh, figure into the decisions you're making here? Into the sales tax decision? Yeah, well, yeah just into the, the strategy you're making as you position Salt Lake City. And part of why I ask that is, sure. in some ways, you know, the prison relocation was a big thing. The inland port becomes a big thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, presumably you have to have a really good strategy about how you're working with the state. We want to be a good partner with the state, and we see the caliber of growth. I, I, I think I can speak at least on behalf of the council, the opportunities for growth, the caliber of that growth is such that it is going to be a support to uh, many more outside of the boundaries of Salt Lake City. We need to be able to grow so that we can be that city that isn't behind the ball, but we're ahead of the ball. We know what growth is coming. The state's prosperity calls for cities to plan and act on growth. That is what we're doing here. We're not just catching up, but we're getting ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor? You know, we have been um, working very closely with the state since I came in. Um, the, the amount of economic opportunity, for instance, you know, we've done a billion dollars in capital investment for economic development in this city in two years. And that's because we've been partnering with the state and EDC Utah. The other piece to that is, for instance, the Northwest Quadrant you know, um, we master planned the Northwest Quadrant before the session even began. We knew that the inland port was coming. Uh, that is master planned and ready uh, for development. And we also spent a great deal of time working with Senator Stevenson, both uh, Council Member Mendenhall and I uh, worked diligently with him on legislation and, and value that relationship with the state. Um, I think what happened in the end with the Inland Port is unfortunate. It is devastating to our city. We will have to make sure that we fix uh, the legislation that passed or, you know, if that does not occur because House leadership has put a stake in the ground then we will have to look at, you know, what the city has to do on behalf of the city. And that puts us all in a bad situation. I'm very hopeful that the House comes to the table, works with the Senate and the governor, who was very clear in his letter about the concerns the city has that he wants addressed in a special session this year. So we'll see. More to come. More, More to, to come. come. I, I always like to end on a really good note, but there's going to be some good questions here. So as I toss out the questions, I will say, Congratulations on the success at the Salt Lake City International Airport. 
I just finished eight years of service on the right. airport board. The mayor thank knows you this. for your and, service. Well, what an amazing uh, gift it is to the state. It is, and it speaks volumes to the expertise that we have within city government and, and why I'm so confident that um, the inland port concept really is something that can evolve under the leadership of our expertise, just as the airport. And as you should know, not one single taxpayer dollar is going into the construction of the airport. Everyone should know that $3.6 billion project is not coming out of our pockets. And that is how city government is run, and that is how business is won in Salt Lake City. Unheard of. Okay, let's jump out to questions. Who's got them? Sir, in the back, will you please uh, tell us your name, who you're with? Yeah, great question. I'm happy to take a stab at it, Jason. Thanks for that question. The sales tax, if we, uh, we're looking at a vote for next Tuesday, let's assume that vote happens and that it passes, we wouldn't actually begin collecting revenue for about four months just based on the paperwork between the state and the city. Um, and the, as you'll be seeing from the mayor's budget presentation, which I have yet to see, obviously, on May 1st, she'll be presenting her budget. I understand that. Just, yeah, just Great. toss those for a okay. minute. Okay. But they'll be, be uh, we'll be able to see two budgets, basically, one assuming a sales tax and one without it. So you will be able to directly see what projects would or wouldn't be funded had the sales tax passed or not passed. Uh, that said, the streets projects, we just had a presentation last night based on the pavement condition survey. Uh, we're also talking, you know, this is a two-part ask. We're asking for residents to renew a general obligation bond that we passed as voters for, to support uh, Library Square. That bond is expiring, and with uh, about $5 per year additional per household, we're looking at an $87 million general obligation bond. That, this is a two-part ask, and we really haven't talked much about that this morning, but this, we need both, and both combined is still not enough actually to address all of the needs we're talking about. So streets, we can't afford to, or we don't have the bandwidth truly to do $87 million worth of work in the first year or even in the second year. So that will be uh, parsed out in, in about quarters, I imagine, but we're still having that conversation. We had a public conversation last night that you can look up about whether we do 60% arterials and 40% local streets or 80% arterials and 20% local streets or some iteration therein. So the short story is streets is going to take us time because it is so much uh, woman power to get that done. And then the police, we've already hired 27, I believe, and we're looking at a, ne a, a second recruiting class of 23. So they are not on the streets yet. They're in training. And if our police chief is here, he can probably throw a rock at me and correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Okay. Aaron, you made an important thing that I just think it's important for the audience to know. So you have a sales tax vote this month. And then on the November ballot, a geo bond That's right. increase, what, $87 million, I think you said. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Yes, and, and the two are playing very well together because the bond can only be spent on infrastructure, like um, the complete rebuild of roads, for instance. And it cannot be used for affordable housing or transit, getting more bus routes and more police frequency officers, or police staff, officers. This is, and streets are our biggest need. So it's very important to get that one time influx of funding to help us really take a bite out of the deficit of uh, investment in that part of our community. So we're very hopeful that the community will get on board and get behind these plans. We will be doing the dashboard. It'll be up and running, and you'll be able to track everything that's happening. And um, I'll that again. sorry. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I don't know what's happening. There you go. So we um, we want to make sure we're very transparent, and we do have projects that are ready, and we do have housing. Um, plans that can be implemented immediately. We have transit plans that we will have to partner either with UTA or potentially even the University of Utah bus system to bring additional service in. But um, 
all of that is ready um, and will be able to move quickly on all of these fronts, um, which is, I think, one of the most exciting parts about it all. Great. Thank you. Next question. Please tell us your name and who you're with. Um, hi, I'm Derek Deitch. I'm just on my own right now. Um, so I think that in addition to housing, transit, and other infrastructure development, things like that, it's also important to have social development. So that is food, arts, shopping, nightlife, things like that. Could you elaborate on the state of culture and maybe sure. social development? Yeah, so um, there's a couple things that are happening. Um, we finished the cultural core plan for downtown Salt Lake City. That had been out there lingering for about a decade, and that plan is now done, and we are in the implementation phase of that, and you can go online and see what's happening in the cultural core and what we'll be doing with that project, but it's very exciting. Um, the other piece is we have very unique developments happening. We have two designations that we got that are federal designations in our community. They're the first time we have ever received these. They are Main Street Project designations. One is on State and one is on Ninth South. That is going to create for us real economic opportunity to bring those two corridors into our city up um, to a very active, livable community part of our city, which is very exciting stuff. We are also recipients of a Daniel Rose Foundation grant, and the work that we are doing uh, with them is happening right now, and that is in mostly in the kind of two, three, four, five block, which is second east, it is third south, it is fourth east, it is fifth south, kind of that neighborhood. And how do we really develop that neighborhood so it has its own identity? It becomes its, you know, ninth and ninth or fifteenth and fifteenth or whatever that looks like. So we're very excited about all of the time and attention we're getting nationally from partners to help us really bring life into our community in a way that we just haven't done before. And you'll see a lot of change coming in the next couple of years. Sir, in the back, and say, share your name and who you're with. Terry Marasco, I work with you, Tom Ryan, so clean now, also a businessman. <clears throat> so I'm playing the devil's advocate. So you hear about all this growth from the state and the county and the city. I think it's boom town, it's like gold has been discovered. And the citizens start scratching their heads. Why do I have to pay my taxes? Why aren't this, why isn't this growth and all these new properties, businesses, and sales tax? And Yuppies coming in and buying expensive wine. Why, why aren't they supporting the sales tax enough to do the kinds of things that need to be done? So, citizens. Yeah, great question. I, I want to just repeat the question a little bit. So, the question is you know, it is a very prosperous time in our state and in our city. And presumably, when you're prosperous, tax revenues grow. Why isn't that enough? And can I take just one second on this? Just because. This is an, a topic that the Gardner Policy Institute's looked at quite closely, and, and we will be publishing a visual guide to tax modernization in our state. But the big challenge with the sales tax is the base is just shrinking. So because of remote sales, internet, uh, changing purchasing patterns, an economy that's moved towards a service economy, we don't tax services in this state. So the base is just diminishing, and this is one of the fundamental reasons why sales tax is not keeping up with growth. With that, That's a fabulous what, would, what would the uh, elected officials right. like to and say? I, I would like to say that actually yuppies coming to the city and buying expensive wine is going to be part of the sales tax increase. <laughs> yes, so, but we need a wider variety of wine. Buy more wine. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, the other piece goes back to what Council Member Mendenhall mentioned, and that is 60% of our land use is non-tax paying. So that makes it very difficult to keep up. So, you know, how do we overcome that? And really, as a community, we're at a, a very unique point in time where we have to decide what we want our city to look and feel like and what we want those services to be. And, and we have that opportunity. And as residents, you can voice your opinion today, and we'll see where we go. Tell us your name. Oh, my name is Joel Cannon. I, I live in Glendale. I'm not sure I understand how the city 
influences the development of new low-income housing? I, I just don't understand the process since I think of it as developers that actually do it. And, and how can I understand what to expect um, the influence to be on my, on my neighborhood? How, how, how do I know what's going to happen in the future? Great question. Um, actually, I think our Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development is here, and, you, and she could raise her hand. You could probably chat with her a little more after. But the growing SLC, the growing Salt Lake City Housing Plan, Affordable Housing Plan, that the mayor uh, submitted to the council, we approved it just a few months ago, is a f short term, really, a five-year look at how we're going to grow affordable housing in the city. So I encourage you to go to that website, check out Growing SLC for a, a deeper dive. But I will tell you that there's a, we have a policy commitment as the city council, and I know that the mayor is as well, that we don't want to build projects. The projects are not happening in Salt Lake City. We are not going to build a, an affordable housing complex that is all affordable housing, and that's all. Um, we, it would be a lot faster for us to meet our 7,500 unit need if we were going to do something like that. We will not do that. And so what that means is it's going to take us longer but the beauty is there's more of a dovetail with uh, the private market development. So we can offer incentives like low interest loans. We can offer things like land that the city owns at, at deep discounts in exchange for a portion of affordable housing to be included in a development that perhaps wouldn't have had any affordable housing in it otherwise. So it broadens our reach. It doesn't put the burden solely on the city to build and maintain housing, which we as a city don't want to do. We have the county housing authority and the city housing authority that do a very good job of that and are some of the builders, developers, and managers of housing. So there's, it's a way for us to get a broader reach of construction. Um, we don't ever want to have the projects, and you can look a little deeper at that growing SLC plan to see how and where. The, the one thing I do want to bring to your attention is these mailers. If this is sitting on your counter somewhere, take a look at this. We've sent out a couple of these, but on here is our funding our future slc.com website. That is the website that will evolve into the dashboard. And so you want to, to, to get on there, do the survey if you haven't done it yet, but then take note that this is going to be your, your eyes and ears essentially for what's happening in the city. All right, tell us your name and who you're with. <laughs> Now, two questions about that dashboard. There is a digital divide in our community. Not everyone has access in their homes or even necessarily readily in their schools or places of employment to get to that dashboard. So how are you going to communicate beyond digital needs? And then my second question is about development on the west side, near State Street, 9th and 9th, which is Central City, 15th and 15th East Side. What about 15th and 15th West, 9th and 9th West? How are you going to spread that wealth to the west side of the community that's been promised? that love for a long time. Right. And, and that's all part of our plan. If you look at our plans, our housing, affordable housing plans, you look at our economic development plans, any, our transit plans, you know, the, the west side of our community is uh, very much involved. But I will also say to you, interestingly enough, when we did the street study, for instance, um, the worst streets, are not west of the freeway, which um, I think surprised us, but yet I know what my street looks like, and I know it's one of the worst. So, you know, I, I don't live west of the freeway, but I will say that we, are, we will continue to do mailing. Uh, we will continue to do outreach with, through our community councils. Um, in fact, we've did a, a little bit of an uptick in funding to community councils so that information can be shared uh, much easier through these community councils, um, knowing that we have a digital divide. Um, but we have been working on narrowing that divide as well and making progress there. So we're working on all of that communication to make sure that community members are informed. Ahead, I'll, I'll add to that, Laura, that we've done some specific investments in schools, Boys and Girls Club, you know, with the new uh, Glendale Library, um, that we are, that there's also a community center there, that we are making specific investments in an effort to actually uh, fund the 
digital enterprise and the access at those locations. Um, and in addition with, you know, Google Fiber, our hopes have, have been high and we'll continue to have those, press those questions as the equity of digital divide remains an issue. It absolutely is an issue. And also the West Side Master Plan that the council approved a couple of years ago now, um, if you drive along Ninth West, you're seeing those improvements. We are, we did a unique thing because of our desire for equity in upfront funding for implementation of the West Side Master Plan for many facets of it. So you're starting to see some of those infrastructure changes, those bulb outs and curb cuts and bike lanes. Um, and the nine line corridor is one, that's another specific funding. We just received uh, half a million dollars from the county to help us implement the nine line. That's, a, that's going to be an incredible bike and pedestrian connector from Ninth and Ninth West hopefully all the way up to Parley's into the zoo eventually. And then third part of what I want to mention there is this transit master plan absolutely recognizes as one of our top tier priorities the need for a ninth south bus. We want a ninth south bus that is so reliable you don't even have to check a schedule that runs so early and so late you don't even have to think about it. And as we have conversations with the school district, they know that if a kid misses the bus in the morning from the west side to get to east high, the likelihood of them getting to school is very low. And likewise, if they want to stay after for, for tutoring or classes or clubs, programs, getting home is really difficult. So this is actually, it's more than the city and UTA or the city and the university. This conversation is brought in even to the school district about how can we all get our, our goals together. And Ninth South is a major goal. I know for Councilmember Kitchen and I, whose district's border Ninth South, you're going to see more development that helps connect that divide. That's great. Let's go to the last question. Uh, we'll go to you if you tell us your name and, and uh, who you're with. Uh, Jen Colby, I'm District 4 resident. And I really appreciate the effort to first analyze the needs and then work back to how we pay for it rather than the sort of the usual zero-based budgeting and, and kicking the cans down the road. I also feel as though sometimes Salt Lake is trying to figure out how to pay for things that really should be paid for at different levels of government. We're left holding the bag. And I also understand your need for uh, reducing the number of options, given that the money will still be limited if the sales tax goes forward. But I'm concerned about several key uh, areas and issue areas that aren't addressed in the funding package. Specifically, the city looked at trails and parks, which also have been suffering from substantial deferred maintenance. And as we have more and more dense housing, people need somewhere to walk their dogs and take their kids and that sort of thing. And there's a severe lack, certainly in Central City. Also concerned that we're trying to solve fundamentally public health and social problems with police. And we're not investing in the kinds of things that would actually solve the underlying problems instead we're scattering it. So could you address how those two, why they get left off the table and how those are being addressed perhaps in different ways? So um, for sure parks will be addressed in a different way. We did an early survey um, in which we reached out to the community to ask, you know, what would your priorities be? Should we do a sales tax increase or a bond? And, and the top four things were far and above beyond anything else that came on the list. So percentage wise, there was a very big gap between law enforcement, which was over 50% and everything else was above that to what was next, you know. So we focused in on those four priorities that were identified by residents. Um, but there is a large commitment by uh, council member, chair Mendenhall and myself in our parks. And we have been doing um, some real analysis within our parks department about needs. And now we are getting a clearer understanding of what the unmet needs are there as well. And, and that is one of those places where the, the uptick in revenue from growth um, likely will be targeting is, will use that uptick in growth to help pay for that park system. But we have been investing. Uh, thanks for the question, Jen. You'll you probably remember, because I remember you advocating for the Parks Bond years ago when it failed, that I was in the minority of support to get the Parks Bond on the ballot. Didn't happen. 
we recognize that the connectivity issue that you talked about, being able to walk to a park more conveniently. Uh, Councilmember Kitchen, again, who's here, thanks for being here today, and I care a lot about our alleyways, and I think that they're a totally underutilized resource for connectivity. We built the McClellan Trail, which was never an alley, but it looked like one. Um, if you guys haven't checked that out, uh, about 12th east between 13th south and 17th south. It goes north and south in both directions from there. But um, that kind of connectivity where you can safely ride a bike, we know that less than 10% of the population is comfortable riding in a bike lane next to traffic, and that jumps to over 80% when you're in a protected bike lane or in a separate trail. So these opportunities for us to interconnect to our parks and recreation areas through our alleyways is an incredible opportunity that we're always hawk eyeing and looking for opportunities to wedge in there. I also want to say the impact fees, which is growth money that we have, actually does pay for parks to an extent. We have a large fund set aside for a new downtown park. I know that our parks department is looking for that property and we have uh, several million dollars set aside waiting to build a, another park downtown. Um, we're also in conversation with the Pioneer Park Coalition around what kind of iterations, perhaps public-private partnerships can happen at, at Pioneer Park to make that a really different kind of experience downtown. So it's an ongoing conversation. Very good. Aaron, while you have the mic there, will you uh, go ahead and introduce and uh, flag the other uh, city I'd council members that are in the room? Thank you. Our vice chair, council member Chris Wharton, he's right here and he represents District 3. And council member and our RDA chair, Derek Kitchen, up here on the front row, represents District 4, which we're sitting in. Thank you. No, nope, three. Sorry. Across the street. You're almost there. Mayor, did you want to introduce did, any of your Were there your, any other council um, members department I heads. Thanks. You have some department heads in the room? Yeah, so um, Mike Reberg, who runs community and neighborhood. And then Melissa, are you... Uh, so Melissa Jensen is our uh, housing guru and been phenomenal to work with and she's the director of housing and um, I know Patrick Leary is here. He is our chief of staff. Um, Mary Beth right here is our finance guru and helping us uh, do all the juggling with, with our um, treasurer and others on, on the bonds and how we should do the bonding. Um, and then Liz Bueller is back here. She's been doing our public engagement. So if you have more questions about the public engagement piece, um, seek her out. She'd be happy to answer some questions about that. Okay, so I am, I've mentioned I'm not a resident of Salt Lake City, but I've always um, taken the idea that the capital city belongs to us all. And so in a very real way, you're my mayor, you're my city council chair, and we just want to thank you for your service. Let's give them a hand. Yeah. 